eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you, into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. today. Those of you online, we want to thank you for joining us. I've seen several of you already make comments and, and your greetings uh, and also your prayer requests. We want to continue to lift up those things. Uh, we're going to continue to lift up uh, each other. Let's have a word of prayer though as we join together today in worship. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and be part of God's people, collectively worshiping you, giving our praises to you, the one and the only who deserves our praises, deserves our attention, deserves our respect and glory. We thank you, God, for calling us here to be your people. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Now go ahead and or we have our call to worship. Give thanks to God, for God is good. Give, Give thanks, thanks for God's, God's steadfast God's love. love. Give thanks to God, for God's love endures. We Give, Give thanks, thanks to God as at work among human kind. Give thanks to God, for only God can satisfy us. We give thanks to God for filling our spiritual hunger with good things. God of compassion, today, remind us of what really matters. Often we show up for worship expecting to be entertained. Instead, we be active participants in worship today, focusing on kindness, love, and our sacred worth in you. God, you are so good, and you are in our midst. Amen. Guys, a few prayer requests I want to share with each other. I want to continue to remember Gina and her family uh, with her mom passing uh, last week. 
and uh, continue to remember them. Also continue to remember uh, Chris Arredondo's family, uh, his passing away last week. Uh, uh, they've got, I think he's gone for re uh, cremation now. Um, I still know word, uh, but they likely said that he uh, died in his sleep uh, from a heart attack. Continue to pray for Kathy's brother, Dennis. Uh, I understand he's been moved up on the transplant list, and so uh, that's some good news, but then we want to also continue to pray that all the things work too well in that favor, and, uh, and God brings all that together for them. Our prayers for Anna Barrett and family. Uh, her husband passed away unexpectedly uh, this past Sunday. Uh, she's a longtime friend and co-worker of our firm or co-worker of Nina's, so we want to remember uh, Anna's family. Uh, James asked us to remember his uncle, uh, uh, Jimmy died this uh, past week in a, in a tragic car accident. Uh, so leaving the family with lots of bills and lots of uh, just, you know, the, the loss of all that as well as the financial loss. Tina wants us to continue to pray for her to find uh, in, uh, gainful employment. So we want to lift her up. Terrence was just uh, sent a text message in, online. He's watching online and he asked us to pray for um, his mother. Uh, she lost her brother last night. So that's Terrence's uncle. We want to pray for that. And I got a text from uh, uh, Tammy Irons from California. Praises that Trinity's still here 37 years ago. Reverend Crisco and Deacon Noel Tardy and Trinity took me under their wing and Trinity is an integral part of her growing up. So our, I want to lift up Tammy and thanks uh, for that praise again uh, and recognizing our existence here. So let's give God the glory today. Any other prayer requests you want to share or praises report? Yes. Good, good, good. So praise God for that. That's it's always good for our work life to be relieved when uh, those in charge of us <laughs> are, are well. Good, good, good. All right, let's go to God then. God, you truly are greater and higher and more wonderful than anything we could ever ask. And yet, God, we do still have struggles and problems and obstacles and things to overcome here on this earth. So God, we just ask that your mighty, protective, and loving hand be upon each of these things. Heal as you see fit, God. Guide and strengthen as you, we know you can. Deliver abundance to those that are looking for gainful employment and those that are tr struggling in their finances. God, help us as a people to continue to look to you to give you glory for all the wonderful things here. As we, as Tammy said, take people in and being an integral part of their lives. God, we want to be that. That's who you've called us to be. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Let's continue with our praise and worship. Renew my life uh, may be a song that's a little, uh, as unfamiliar to you we're going to sing the whole song one time and then after that you'll be able to get the tune and catch and then sing along with us a second time okay Because all that I have 
within my heart needs to be changed by you, oh Lord, because all that I have within my heart needs to be Second chapter of the letter to the Colossians, chapter one, uh, chapter two, verses one through ten. Let's give glory to God. Glory to you, God. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you, and for the church of Laodicea, and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ Himself. In Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I'm far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Jesus, Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that, 
that come from human thinking and the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are also you excuse me, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. This is the Holy Scripture. Praise to thee, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. I, I failed to mention, I forgot, uh, Cherie texted me uh, yesterday. Her brother-in-law, Tom, had a stroke while driving and had an accident, so continue to pray for him. I don't know any more uh, about that, but continue to pray for Cherie's uh, brother-in-law, Tom. <clears throat> I was able to go home to my family's uh, home yesterday to help my mom with some stuff and my brother to do some things around the house up there. And, and of course, we've had this drought, and it's just two hours north, so it's not like it's another country or anything like that. But we had this drought, and so we've had stock pond that I remember us having back when I was a kid, stock pond. We'd swim in that stock pond, and we'd do all kinds, before the snakes took over, but we, the snakes and turtles. But we did swim in it before then. But yesterday, I was able to walk completely across the pond, and that's, it's not like I'm Jesus walking across water. There was no water there. It was just dirt and it wasn't even mud dirt like it i wasn't sinking in anywhere i just was able to walk completely across so continue to pray for uh, uh our drought situation in this area uh, pray for that a woman who lived next door to her preacher was puzzled by his personality change at home he was seemed to be shy and quiet and retiring but in the church he was a real fiery orator, orator. He would rise the masses in the name of God. And it was as if he was two different people. So one day she decided she was going to ask him about this dramatic transformation that came over him when he preached. And his answer, he said, well, that's my alter ego. Uh. <laughs> this, yeah, exactly. Where's the bum drum strike that y'all have? This letter to the church of Colossa was... Uh, they were, the, the church was about a thousand, excuse me, a hundred miles inland from the port of Ephesus in the Roman province of Asia. This was written about 61 AD, and while Paul was probably under house arrest in Rome. And although little remains of the city today, in, in Roman times, Colossa was an important city on the banks of the river Lycos uh, near the modern town of Honez, Turkey. So if you try to figure that out on a map. And if you remember, Paul has never visited this church before and likely never ended up being able to visit the church. But it was because of his ministry in Ephesus that Epaphras became saved and he was first Christian, became a Christian, and he went out and helped start these churches in Colossa and in Laodicea and another one in Heropolis. So in this letter, Paul condemns the false teachings that are circulating in Colossa. He insists that this angel worship that they were talking about, these secret knowledges, these mysterious things they were trying to put their lives into, and this aestheticism, this religious sacrifice, this legalism, none of this had place in Christian belief. And he repeats his teachings that Gentile believers do not need to adopt the old Jewish religious laws to be circumcised or to do all the other things that they needed to do to be made right with God. Because Christ was the one that made them right with God. Now last week, if you remember, we heard a little bit about Paul's own suffering for the truth of Christ and the persecution that he faced and his imprisonment. Now first let me talk about persecution here, that persecution part. Apostle Paul and the other Christians were being persecuted for the truth in Christ. And as Paul said in chapter 1, chapter 1, he said in verse 24, I'm glad when I suffer for you in the body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that will continue for his body, the church. Now we in America, and especially American Christians, seem to be complaining a lot about being persecuted. You may have even heard some say those kind of things. They can't have their Ten Commandments at the Capitol unless other religions do the same. Can't have prayer in school. Can't restrict what the woman does with her reproductive health. Can't keep biblical marriage safe. Can't keep non-Christians out of America. So on and so on and so on. You hear those kind of things and they complain like they're being persecuted. 
A few years ago, um, Grace G. Sung Kim and Susan Shaw published an article in the Huffington Post titled, Christians in the U.S. Are Not Persecuted, an Intersectional Theo Theological Response. And in it, they said, Evangel evangelicals say Christians are being persecuted, and they are, but not in the United States. In fact, the U.S. doesn't even make the top 50, according to Open Doors World Watch List, who watches for martyrs and, and other persecuted Christians worldwide. They said worldwide persecution of Christians is rising, but evangelicals' claim of the persecution in the U.S. is unfounded and rooted in intersexual, intersecting legacies of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and colonialism. Texas's own embarrassment, Rick Perry said back in 2011 when he, he was trying to run for president, there's something wrong in this country when gays can serve openly in the military, but our kids can openly pray in school. First of all, that's factually false, factually inaccurate. It's shameful for a man who wanted to be president to say something de demonstratively false. And isn't it sad that sometimes presidents do that or people trying to be president do that? It never has been illegal for children to pray in school. What is illegal is the unconstitutionality for individual teachers or for government-sponsored institution to promote one religion over another. When a teacher tells you it's time to pray in Jesus' name, what are we supposed to do about the Jewish kid or the Muslim kid or, or even the atheist kid? And with all the denominational differences in Christianity, do the Baptists really want a Catholic leading their child in a Hail Mary? Or the Mormon teacher telling a Bible story example from the Book of Mormon? Christians would have a fit. Much of recent U.S. evangelical history has assumed conservative Christianity was the preeminent place for U.S. policy and law and practice. And that assumption also presumes pre whiteness and maleness and heterosexuality and U.S. citizenship and characteristics of U.S. Christianity and the dominant U.S. culture. It is also presumed God was white, male, heterosexual, and probably American. Yeah, and you've heard people even imply that. In fact, my niece, when we were going through some pictures, there was a... Uh, I forgot the last the lady's first name, Madame Trousseau, the Madame Trousseau uh, Wax Museum in, in uh, Arkansas. There was some postcard we had from there, and it had the the um, sort of the Da Vinci's table of Jesus Last Supper, and it had the reenactment of that. And, and and my niece looked at it right away, and she said, "Why is Jesus white? Why is everybody on here white?" <laughs> Which is true. It's like they they weren't somehow we think they were, but they weren't. As the civil rights movement, movement and the women's movement and the gay liberation and the Black Lives Matter and immigration and queer and trans movements and other forces challenge that dominance of white Christianity and the heteropatriarchy, many evangelicals have experienced the progress of these groups as persecution of these evangelicals. And they've... Um, and have been expected to follow the state and federal laws that have granted rights to these various minorities and somehow they feel like that's persecution. For some evangelicals expecting a conservative Christian bakery to provide a wedding cake for a lesbian couple seems to be framed as persecution. Folks, American Christianities and American Christians aren't being persecuted. They're being called out and being ridiculed because they're not Christ-like. That's what it is. Ignoring the oppressed is not Christ-likeness. Insisting upon our own ways or rights against others, that's not Christ-likeness. Using legal strategy to become uh, controlling over other people and their personal and private lives, that's not Christ-likeness. Limiting a woman's choices in her reproductive health care, that's not Christ-likeness. And it's not pro-life either. Maintaining law and order with prison industrial complex, that's not Christ-likeness. Being anti-immigrant and having stances against that, that's not Christ-likeness. And for heaven's sakes, Jesus' parents were immigrants themselves when they had to flee to Egypt and live several years there because of Herod wanting to kill Jesus as a child. 
Maybe there's more ridicule and scrutiny of Christians in America, in the media, and in society at large. Maybe more than any other religion, but that's because Christians are the majority and often they behave less like their namesake, Jesus Christ. American Christians aren't being persecuted. But folks, we do need to continue to point out and correct theirs and our own biases that don't line up with the loving truth of Jesus. American Christians are like strong-willed children that throw a temper tantrum fit if you try to correct them. And maybe, maybe they just need a little bit of a time out or a come to Jesus meeting, don't you think? Well, Paul was trying to do this with this group. He was addressing some of these deceptively well-crafted arguments, these empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense, he says. Basically, he was saying, if it isn't grounded in the truth of Christ Jesus, it's not worth listening to. We need to be deeply rooted in Jesus. And Paul says you need to be deeply rooted in Jesus so that you can know the difference. I was recently listening to a young person the other day talk about their past church and why they don't attend church at all anymore. When those teachings weren't hurting them, they could say amen and nod their head. But as they've gotten older, they've realized that those teachings were really more about control than love. And they realized that their gay friend or their Muslim co-worker or their favorite aunt that made a hard choice in her reproductive health or even themselves with their live-in partner of a different race wouldn't be fully accepted in the church of their past. And they attributed to the false understanding of maybe God just didn't love them or accept them either. And I did my best to let them know that they were worthy, welcomed, and loved in Jesus. You see, we need to have an intersectional, intersectional theology which allows us to not to ignore human suffering, nor will it allow us to cause suffering in the name of God. Because underlining all of it is an equal value of all of us toward our collective and contradictory and scary and exhilarating understandings of who God is in our lives. It'll compel us to speak out against real persecution, against Christians around the world, or against the Jews and Muslims in the U.S. who actually do suffer the most religious persecution here in our country. It'll help us to stand up to discrimination and biases of any type. Because Christ loved fully and sought to disrupt the systems that favored some over others. The Apostle Paul says in verse 2 of our passage today, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The church needs encouragement, and Paul was trying to do that. I was telling someone the other day how powerful your love and your encouragement has been to me and how proud I am of you. This knit together, though, I like the, the term, this knit together, and, and it made me think of something I'd done a long time ago when I was a youth uh, director. I had the youth group set in a circle, and we took a ball of twine, and uh, we had, it was kind of a share circle, if you will, and had a ball of twine, and each kid would share something about what was going on in their life or what God meant to them, and they were sharing their truth. And then once they finished, they would take the ball and throw it to another person. Now, I didn't force everybody to speak. If a child didn't want to do it, they could say pass, and they could pass it on to someone else. But it gave everybody a chance, and so each person got the ball for a moment, and then they were supposed to hold the string and then pass it on to them. So they were holding the remaining piece as it goes to another. And after a while, at this zigzagging back and forth as they're passing all the kids, it sort of made a little spider's web-like thing. And I asked them to pull their piece tight as they pulled back their piece. And then I reached out into the middle, and I grabbed one single strand, and I lifted it and let it snap back, and as it snapped back into place, the vibrations kind of rippled all the way to each person. That's how we are knit together, folks. As a Christian church, deeply rooted in Christ, 
your praises, your joy, your suffering, your sorrow, your service, your needs, they all affect each other. And we need to make sure that we're all tied, we're all knit together in Christ's love. Paul continued to say, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thanks, thankfulness. There are personal things you can do to be more rooted in Christ. And you don't need the rest of the church to do that. Your own Bible readings, your own devotionals, your own quiet times and prayer times. Then also inviting, then those common things we can do together, the listening and the worship together, the faithful teaching and the preaching, seeking godly advice from other Christians. Those are some things we can also do. Those, but, but it's more important than that, I believe. Some people talk about their personal Lord and Savior, but you know, it is our personal Lord and Savior, but it's not a private thing. We should be serving others. We should be letting others know of our love and our sacrifice for them so that we are sacrificing for Christ. Our service and our sacrifice in the church. That's a giving of our time, our talent, our treasure. The things that we give to the church are giving back beyond us. That is another way we can be rooted in Christ. Paul says, when you grow your faith rooted deep in Christ, you're going to overflow with thankfulness. Amen? Now, this isn't some Pollyanna thinking. Paul, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, said in verse, chapter 5, verse 16, Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. When he wrote that and when he was writing this particular letter, both times he was in prison and was still being thankful in all circumstances. Being a Christian, following Christ, shed a different light on the trials that he was going through. C.S. Lewis once wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Just like the sun lets us know that it's another day, it also helps us to see our world more clearly. How we look at our world, how we look at our neighbors, how we move in our world and come in contact with others. We should be seeing those things with the lens of Christ. Now these aren't rose-colored glasses. These are Christ-colored glasses. My faith and life are grounded and deeply rooted in Jesus. Where my religion is one that has enough for love and compassion for all people. My religion isn't one that doesn't need to discriminate to prove itself. My kind of religion is one that looks at our diverse LGBTQI straight community and says, not that it and says, not that is Jesus. I wrote this, but it doesn't make sense. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that not, who cares? I, that it's beautiful, that it is Jesus, and that it is beautiful. That, I guess that's what I was trying to say. Not that it's a problem. It's a, the diversity is beautiful. Folks, may we be a people who never grow tired of digging deeply into the gospel, looking intentionally at Jesus, Praying that he would be the object of our worship and the lens through which we see the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness to us. God, help us to demonstrate your love by our faithfulness to you and our love to others. In Jesus' holy name. This is our time of giving. If you are online, we really thank you for your on, ongoing gifts. And your, you can give by going to our website and dropping down to the bottom there. And there's a, a giving tab. Just click on that. You can set up your giving for ongoing or you can just give a one-time gift. And you can choose where it goes at the different ministries we have available as well. And we thank you for that. And if you're here in the church, you're welcome to fill out an envelope and put it in the offering plate. And then it can continue to mail those in to us. And we appreciate that as well. 
let's, uh, what am I, oh, now I'm doing our confession. All right, come on. <laughs> Please join me in the confession. Loving Christ, forgive us when we allow other things to cloud our attentions. Strengthen us to follow you. May our roots grow down into you and our lives be built upon you. Your word says you are the way, the truth, and the life. Grow our faith strong in that truth so that we will overflow with the thankfulness. If you're at home, we invite you to join us in, co in communion. And if all you have to do is get, gather some things to, uh, to celebrate. It could be any elements that you have in the house. It could be cookies and milk. It could be uh, water and cracker, a uh, piece of bread, juice, whatever you have as you celebrate Christ's body and blood. We honor Christ in this time. It's not about the elements. It's about who Christ is. You're welcome to gather those at this time. We've had the opportunity to hear God's word today, to say our confession aloud and in our hearts. In the name of Christ, our creator, Christ the child, and our holy comforter and guide. May you be forgiven. Go and forgive likewise. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he had gathered the disciples in the upper room. And they were sharing in this meal. And he took a piece of bread and he blessed it. And God, we thank you for this. And he said, this is my body, my body which is given for you. Take and eat. And then he broke it and passed it among them. And then he took a cup of wine, fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood, my blood that is freely poured out for you. It is blood of a new covenant. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, remember me. Holy God, we ask that you bless these elements here in our community today. But the elements of those beyond us, as they share in their own time with us in the communion of saints, may you bless each of these elements as we honor Christ and remember all he did for us in love. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let us repeat the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ shall come again. Alleluia. Beloved, this is an open communion. What we mean by that in all MCC churches and, and around our world is that everyone is welcome. No one's denied, no one's pushed aside, no one's forgotten. All are welcome at this table. We only ask that you do as Christ asked, to remember him. So as we do remember him, we do take the bread and the wine, his body and blood, and we share that today. God, we thank you for this opportunity to share in Christ's body and blood, to share it with each other, to share it with those beyond this room, to know, God, that it's being shared all around our world today because of our faithfulness to you, to remember who you are as you were faithful to give of yourself to us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. For our announcements, we have a couple of things. We do are, are taking up uh, the collections for um, for the children's going back to school. Uh, we do have we're helping all LGBT saves, which is the gay uh, uh, group of teens in the Tarrant County area, as well as we're helping out the Chamber of Commerce. And so, if you brought any of those things, we'll collect those today. If you're still trying to get those together, or you or you forgot, let me know. I'm going to try to be delivering these early this week. So, if you do have some other things to add to that collection let me know and we can get that out to them 
Also, we will have, starting next week, we'll be having uh, Kona Ice here every Sunday in the month of August. So we'll enjoy a, a sweet, cooling treat here uh, with each other and having a good time. Uh, fellowship. Invite others come in. It's kind of a fun thing to have this little thing pull up. It feels like we're little kids again. And, uh, and, and even the kids love it. So it's kind of fun as well. Also, we do have the t-shirts in the back as well if you want to buy one of the new t-shirts for $25. All right, let's stand for our final song together. Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Oh, there are some treats here if you want to have some like popsicle treats while we're here.